Washington Examiner Chief Political Correspondent Byron York. Follow him at Byron York, one of America's best equipped sleuths. Hello, Byron. Good morning. Happy day after President's Day. Good morning, Hugh. Tell me what you make of the uh, the federal judge calling an emergency meeting. I've never heard of this federal judge. I've never heard of the association. I have... Uh, I like to point out to people that the nomin- uh, the denominator of the number of je- lawyers who've worked at the Department of Justice and at a U.S. attorney's office over the last 40 years is somewhere about 500,000. So 1,000 people signing a letter about Barr is nothing. But this federal judge has acted in a way that only the chief justice ought to act, and I think it's very bad for the, the, the judiciary. What is going on here? Well, I think that we have seen for quite a while. For the entire time the president has been in office, we've seen a sort of uh, never-Trump jurisprudence out there. We've seen individual federal district court judges who have issued nationwide injunctions uh, for things. Now, you're the lawyer. I know that there is there is a, a, a movement to, to end that sort of thing that predates Trump, but still, it's been used. It's got Trump. legs from Justice Gorsuch and a few of his comments, and, and there is a large number of us who believe it is an abuse of federal district court judges to issue a nationwide exactly. injunction, period. Yeah. Exactly. But I think that this is a continued <clears throat> a continuation of this never-Trump jurisprudence. And the other thing is on the Stone case specifically, uh, I am not a lawyer here, but there uh, appear to be real merits to the idea that a sentence of seven to nine years was too long. It was excessive. And the one thing that's missing in all of this talk, and you can uh, you can listen to CNN or MSNBC for quite a long time, the one thing you will not hear amid all the talk about the president weaponizing the, the um, uh, Justice Department to go after his uh, enemies, politicizing the Justice Department, the one thing you won't hear is discussion of the substance of, well, was this sentence too long, this proposed sentence too long? And and then I love your phrase, never Trump jurisprudence, because it transcends one branch. It includes both Article 1 and Article 3. Uh, The Article 1 being the legislative attempt to impeach him, Article 3 being the judiciary. I want to stick on this for a second. On stone, For the benefit of the audience, I did the sentencing guidelines as a clerk for George McKinnon in 1984. They exist. I understand that it was within the box that he was supposed to get seven to nine. But we just did sentencing reform at a federal level. We just, Jared Kushner worked the phones to get people out of jail early for white collar crime, nonviolent crime. And look, I'm no fan of Roger Stone. I've never met the man. I haven't spoken one word to him. I've always been part of the Rove team in that that breach in the party that goes back 40 years. But it struck me as insanity seven to nine. And it struck me as insanity that prosecutors quit. And it struck me as an entirely politicized lower rank on a case. And it goes with the team that, that Mueller put together if they're all Democrats, what are you going to believe, your own lying eyes or what the left wants us to take as the narrative, Byron? And, and by the way, the, uh, the, the people in the Justice Department who thought seven to nine was too long were not suggesting that Ro- Roger Stone not go to jail. They were uh, looking at the guidelines. And, and from what I understand, I mean, you can, you can look at these guidelines and s- stretch the facts of the Stone case as, as far as you can to get to seven to nine, or you can look at it in a more reasonable way and you get between three and four years. So I think they were suggesting that the appropriate sentence for Stone would be three to four years. Now, remember, uh, some of the other people involved in, um, in uh, the, the Trump-Russia matter uh, got very, very short sentences. Uh, George Papadopoulos uh, was sentenced to 14 days in jail, served, I think, 12. Um, there was a, a, a minor figure who was also convicted of lying to prosecutors who was also sentenced, I think he was sentenced to 30, but served a good deal less than that. So th- there have been a number of, of relatively short sentences. The people who got long sentences, you have to remember Paul Manafort. I mean, his the, the big crime with Manafort was evading taxes on about $30 million of income. And that was that's a big deal, and it's going to get you jail time. Um, the the issue with Michael Cohen was evading taxes on I think four something million dollars of income. So uh, those were not 
process crimes. The people who have been charged with process crimes in this case uh, have gotten much shorter sentences. So seven to nine within that context seems like a pretty long sentence. I also want you to step back with me. I keep trying to get people to do this. Um, you always have to have an explanation that accounts for every fact. So if we look at the facts of the criminal justice system in Donald Trump and the intelligence community in Donald Trump dating back to 2015, what we see is of a vindictive vendetta re revealing itself over time, um, a reputational disaster for Bob Mueller, for everyone who worked for him. You see an increasingly frenetic and frenzied effort to get somebody to do something wrong, and you see the special counsel institution destroyed as, as once again it reels out of control. Now we see every development politicized in an effort to divert, I believe, attention from John Durham. And what I saw Barr doing with the McCabe decision not to prosecute was what ought to have been done with Michael Flynn, which is, okay, bad, bad move by the person involved, but we are not in the business of going full Javert on political figures in the United States. We let politics figure that out. In other words, I have a theory of the case here, Byron, that we've got a really badly broken DOJ reputation that Barr is trying to fix but the left doesn't want to fix it because if it gets fixed before Durham arrives, that might give Durham traction. What do you think? I don't. Well, first of all, we should not um, speculate too much on what Durham has. Might because, have nothing. Yeah. Uh, certainly among some of the president's strongest supporters, <clears throat> I see people saying, you know, just wait for Durham, wait for Durham. Uh, and they were saying before, wait for Horowitz, wait for Horowitz. And, you know, and the, and the Horowitz report gave us some extraordinary information. I mean, it was really uh, pretty amazing. Um, but what you're seeing now is something actually quite interesting. As um, Bill Barr uh, launches investigations to look into the murky origins of some of these investigations that really uh, tangled up and roiled American politics for three years. The, the Durham investigation, also re-looking re into the, the Flynn case, that has caused a number of people who were perfectly happy with a long, involved Mueller investigation to suddenly become concerned about the power of investigations. The Washington Post did a story about how um, – uh, uh, Barr's inquiries have really caused a lot of disquiet in the Justice Department. Quotes a former U.S. attorney saying, the power to investigate is the power to destroy. The ability to simply point to a pending investigation against a person can have devastating effects on that person and can have potential benefit to the person orchestrating the investigation. Now, you, you don't say. Are you serious? Yeah. And on, on television, on, on cable television, we've seen concern that the president is weaponizing the Justice Department. Well, where were these people for the last three years? Where were these people when the Justice Department used the Logan Act that never prosecuted 1799 dead letter um, as a pretext to go question Michael Flynn? I mean, where were these people during the whole uh, Carter Page FISA and dossier matter? I mean, the the intelligence community and the Justice Department have been weaponized uh, against President Trump for, since before he took office. And more often than not, it, it hasn't led to what um, they hoped it would lead to. But what now it has led to is to a federal judge, Sua Sponte, calling an emergency meeting, which is glommed on to by the Never Trumpers, the Never Trump Rump, and the anti-Trump left, and my friends at MSNBC and CNN, into uh, And what will come out of that is nothing. Absolutely nothing will come out of it except the headline that she called it, because federal judges have no jurisdiction. Uh, she may get a rebuke behind the scenes, or he may get a rebuke, I think it was a she, from the chief justice for politicizing the judiciary. And, and all of my friends in academia who have always warned against politicizing the judiciary, they are silent. This is the most political thing I've ever seen the judiciary do, not in the context of a case. And I, I can't believe... People are not condemning this judge with great, great vehemence because it is a stunning departure from norms. Last word to you, Byron. Um, this stunning departure of norms has taken place across professional fields. It's particularly serious, of course, in the legal field because that involves law enforcement and the meeting out of justice. But we've seen it in other fields. How many 
psychiatrists or mental health no, true. have you yeah. seen declare President Trump to be crazy or senile or paranoid or something or the other, totally breaking a, a, um, a precedent that goes back to the very Goldwater era of, of mental health professionals staying out of this sort of thing. You're Not right. The stunning departure from norms is the norm of our new Never Trump age. Byron York, thank you. Follow him on Twitter at Byron York, B-Y-R-O-N York. Follow me to the next segment here on the Tuesday edition of The Hugh Hewitt Show.